Greetings pals, welcome back to our video series on Back ADNA Programming and in this video we introduce you to another important interfacing peripheral you are very familiar with, the 7 segment display. We will discuss its internal working and how to interface it and as always we will wrap up with a simple project to cement our knowledge. So without further ado, let's do it. But before we start, you may wonder what the hell has happened to that nice high bitch voice you are used to in previous videos. Well, obviously it's another presenter, because we plan a speed of work, so we have decided to work in parallel. You'll have to hear this voice from time to time, so I hope you like it. Not far ago, we introduced a famous yet simple interfacing peripheral, the keypad. And one of the features mentioned about the keypad is its simplicity and familiarity with the users. Well, this one is no different. It's simple and cheap and can almost be found everywhere. Digital clocks, wristwatches, old calculators and many more. The 7 segment display is a good example of the less is more rule. You needn't use an advanced LCD display with thousands of colors and tons of pixels to make a wristwatch that sells fairly well. You can opt for the cheaper, simpler 7 segment array and you're still gonna have an appealing interface at a reasonable cost, let alone the ease of interfacing and manufacturing. To demonstrate to you how simple our device is, you will see it from within. As you can see, it's just a bunch of LEDs arranged in a certain way, with external lines connected to one terminal of each LED and a common line connected to the other. The polarity of those LEDs depends on the type of the display. If the display is common anode, the common line is connected to the positive terminal of the LEDs and each negative terminal is connected to one of the external lines. In the common cathode display, however, it's the opposite. The common line is connected to the negative terminal of all the LEDs and each positive terminal is connected to one of the external lines. Here we have 7 LEDs, hence the name 7 segment, each of which is labeled in alphabetical order, A to G, starting from the top segment and moving clockwise, finishing with the middle one. Another line may be present for the decimal point, but let's keep life simple and neglect the 8th line for now. Now let's see how to display any digit on the device, but before we do that let's split the slide into half for both the common anode and the common cathode variants. First let's start with the common line. In the common anode version we need to place a high voltage, whereas in the common cathode version we need to place a low voltage or ground. If we wish to illuminate one of the segments, we need to place in the corresponding line a voltage level that's opposite to that placed in the common line. For instance, if we want to illuminate the G segment right here, in the common anode version, we place 0 volts in the corresponding line. In the common cathode version, we place a high voltage or 5 volts. On the opposite side, if we wish to turn off a segment, we place a voltage level that's similar to that of the common line. For instance, if we wish to illuminate segment G and turn off other segments, in the common anode world, we place 0 volts in the G line and once in all other lines. I think I already know how to do it in the common cathode version for now. Now let's play a game. I will give you a digit from 0 to 9 and you figure out the segments you need to illuminate and what value to place in external lines in each version accordingly. Let's start with number 0. Pause the video for a while to think about it. Now here it is. We need to drive segments A through F up and put only segment G down. The values written each line for both versions are shown in the slide. Now let's pick another digit, let's say 2. Again, pause the video to think about it. Now as you see, you need to turn on segments A, B, D, E and G, just as shown. Finally, let's see 8. Pause the video one last time. Here we see all the segments need to be illuminated. So just place all zeros in the common anode and all ones in the common cathode. Here's a table of all the digits and their corresponding values on external lines to produce them. Now some final notes before we move on to the next slide. To control the contrast, which is how bright illuminated LEDs are, you have two options. The first option is to control the voltage of the common node, 
and this is achieved by connecting the power source with the potentiometer as shown. In the common anode world, the closer the potentiometer is to the power source, the more the contrast. The opposite goes for the common cathode case. The other option is to change the value of the resistors connected to external lines. By the way, you must connect resistors to external lines, because if you don't, and you drive one of the segments on, a high current is reduced, and that segment and possibly your MCU will be blown up. Now the more the value of the resistor, the less the current and the less the contrast. This one is not practical, so we will resort to the first option. Another thing to note is the number of lines used. The number of external lines is quite big, and it's always desirable to drive the number of lines as low as possible, because as you know we want to save our precious I.O. pins. To do this, a special digital block is designed to do just that, the BCD to 7 segment decoder. Its well-known IC implementation is the CD4511 IC. It's a digital circuit designed to convert from the binary value of the digit the values to be written to the seven segment lines. The minimum number of input lines to cover all decimal digits is four, which is an improvement over seven. Another thing about it is that it makes life simple for a programmer. Just try the digit in binary format to input lines, no tracking of on and off segments or checking of a table is needed. And that's the very reason why we won't use it. Because we start of learning anything the hard way first, so that we learn it by heart. Now comes the next step. We want to scale our display to multiple digits. If you are just use 7 lines for each digit and connect all those lines to our poor MCU, we will run in a disaster since we will run out of pins very quickly. There is definitely a better option. First we choose only one of the digits to be operational at a time. This requires an enable line for each digit which is internally connected to the gate of a transistor across the common line of the digit. Placing zero will disable the digit and whatever value you write to the seven lines won't appear on the display. Note here we are using the common anode version. For the common cathode, just reverse the logic for the enable and the data lines. Because we have chosen to enable only one digit at a time, only a single one can be present in one of the enable lines at any given time. So we do this, we connect the segment lines of all digits together and group them into seven lines common to all the digits. Then we place 1 to the enable line of the digit we wish to place the digit on and 0 to the remaining lines. Then we put the required 7 segment value on the common lines. Now, if we want to operate multiple digits at the same time, or more accurately make it look like we are doing so, we use a method called display multiplexing. We just keep moving the 1 in the enable lines, and each time write the digit we wish to show in that place. For instance, if we have a 3 digit display and we wish to write say 1, 2, 3 left to right, we place 1 in the first enable line and write the 7 segment value for 1 into the data lines. Then we move the 1 and write the 7 segment value for 2 and so for 3 and then we repeat. This process needs to be fast enough so that it appears as if all the 3 digits are shown at any given time but not too fast because this will cause unpredictable behavior. A reasonable speed would be one millisecond per digit. Now it's time for the project. Here we will be implementing a digital clock using an array of six digits, two for hours, two for minutes, and two for seconds. And now the first piece of code I'm gonna demonstrate here is this. It's just, as you can see, an array of 10 8-bit unsigned integers, each of those integers is the 7-bit value to be written to the data lines of the display to display uh, different digits. So for instance, at index 0, we'll be displaying 0 by writing this value. Uh, by the way, this uh, the first bit from the left is for segment A, and the second bit is for segment B, and so on. And also, uh, this is a common anode display, 
So those are the value for the common anode. And so for index 1, this is a value for 1, this is a value for 2, until we reach 9. This is a useful trick, and it saves you a lot of time uh, searching for the value in the table or just tracking the uh, on and off segments. Now those three variables are used to track the current time in hours, minutes, and seconds, and we will increment all of them. Uh, next thing here is that we want to generate an, uh, exactly one second delays in order to increment seconds and thus minutes and hours. Any discrepancy, uh, the slightest discrepancy from one second will introduce errors in the long term. That's something we obviously don't want. So in order to do this, uh, let's follow this equation. First, we will use an external uh, counter variable, which is this. It will reset uh, after 125, so 125. Then we'll be using uh, the timer zero prescaler uh, at a ratio of 1 to 64, so times 64. Then we uh, subtract 125 from the can, uh, timer register at each time, so 125. This will result in 1 million. Trust me, this value is correct. Uh, now, since we are using a 4 MHz oscillator, uh, which is 1 MHz uh, internal instruction clock, then this will generate exactly 1 second, which is what we want. Now, this is the counter variable, and inside the ISR, we will check for the timer zero flag, and uh, then increment the counter variable, and when we reach 125, we reset it to zero and increment seconds. And when we reach 60 seconds, we have to reset the seconds and increment minutes, and so on for hours, and so on until we reach 24 hours. Uh, since we are using a 24-hour system, we will reset hours to zero also. Then here we subtract 125 from timer zero uh, uh, register. Uh, by the way, uh, you can also write TMR 0 L equals 256 minus 125 which is equal to 131 but uh, uh, the better option is to use this to uh, subtract 125 from the current value and this comes from the fact that uh, it takes several cycles to um, uh, from the firing of the interrupt to exit the main function and enter the ISR then executing all this chunk of code until you read the value when you write uh, the timer zero register. So this one is more accurate, and since accuracy, accuracy here is very crucial, then we'll opt for this. We will subtract 125 from the current value. And uh, now we reset the uh, timer zero interrupt flag, and we are done with the ISR. Now inside the main function, first uh, the initial setting of the timer zero module. Uh, the prescaler assignment bit is written to zero to assign the uh, prescaler for the timer zero module. Then the clock selection bit is reset to select the internal instruction clock. Then the three bits of the prescaler are written to five to select one to 64 prescaler. Turn on the timer zero module and enable the interrupt scanning format and uh, set the global interrupt enable bit. Now we'll be using port A for the enable lines and port B for the data lines, so we will write zeros to the trice bits. And then inside the while loop we will be handling the uh, job of multiplexing the display. So we write one to port A, which is the enable lines, so we'll be uh, displaying the first digit. The first digit will be for the tens of hours, so we divide hours by ten and write it inside the square brackets of the 76CA and we order the resulting value with this value to turn off the decimal point. And we delay for 4 milliseconds. I found 4 milliseconds to be fine, uh, obviously in the simulation. I tried 1, but it was uh, seemed very fast, so I in increased it until I reached 4, which was just fine. So just use trial and error to find the value of the delay. Uh, now we shift the 1 uh, to display the second digit, uh, which is ones of hours, uh, which comes from uh, hours modulus 10. 
uh, using the same method and here we don't alter this value in order to display the decimal point which will separate hours from minutes and we delay for another 4 milliseconds and we move, on to, we move on to the tens of minutes using the same way and so for seconds and that's it for the code let's see how the simulation works And that's it for today, if you like what you watch, please hit that thumbs up below and don't forget to subscribe, see ya!